What is up, everybody? Hey, again, you're not supposed to be seeing me. <laughs> I always uh, mess with my video before I go live. You're supposed to be seeing hot, dank memes. What is up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Appreciate you taking your time on a Saturday to hang out with us. We're going to be talking about radio prepping, but specifically bugging in, which means staying home. <laughs> Being prepared to stay home. That's where everybody wants to be. Super comfortable. Staying home. All right. Looks like we got all the things firing live right now. Things are working. We got people coming on in. Come on into the ham radio crash course. Grab a seat in the front. And we'll get started. What is up, everybody? I am Josh, KI6NAZ. Thanks for hopping on to the Ham Radio Crash Course. Today, we got a really good topic. We're going to be talking about preparing, radio preparing specifically. You know, people have a lot of things that they prepare for, and they have a lot of things that they put away for preparing for those things. And I would assume that radios are not necessarily part of those things. So that is what we're going to be talking about. But we will be talking about some news items, some things I'm going to catch you up on, which uh, we'll get started with soon. Uh, Levi Hopkins said, lol, Baofeng caused the coronavirus. Maybe, maybe. Uh, let's see. Hello. Oh, man, so many people. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Middle Georgia, Idaho. We got the UK, I saw. We got Germany in the house, right? On. Very cool. Thank you, everybody, for hopping on. I appreciate it. Saturdays is definitely the ham radio day. Uh, we got a lot of hams that live stream on Saturday, which is super cool. You got, um, uh, oh, man, now I'm, I just had a, a <laughs> OG Dave, Dave uh, Kassler, and, of course, Callum. He streams about an hour before me or two hours before me, but... Very good. Cheers to all them. And I, I did get a little started early on the beer. Closing out the uh, chocolate for dinner stout in my hopsy kit. Uh, and it's, it was pretty good. I really like it. Right on, right on. Okay, so what news do I have to talk about? Well, right up front, just want to remind people, if you haven't already, if you could, give me the thumbs up. Uh, links are in the description as well for our Facebook group and our Discord our Discord is like a traditional chat room with a voice chat component. So you can uh, talk back and forth with people. And what we do at the end of every live stream is we hop on over to the Discord and we do a voice chat, after chat kind of thing where you can ask questions and it's a lot of fun. So uh, go check that out if you haven't. Um, let's see. I did two podcasts this week. I did the Linux in the Ham Shack podcast where we did a further deep dive on ham or keeping ham radio relevant, which if you remember, I did a hack chat, like ask me anything chat room thing. And that was a lot of fun. And we did a deep dive on that with the with the cool people over at Linux in the Ham Shack. And they they brought, I, I think, obviously, they're amateur radio operators as, as we are. Uh, but they brought an interesting perspective, and we were able to kind of bounce some ideas back uh, against each other. I, it was really fun. So if you could go listen to that, uh, go check that out. And then I was also last night on My Alien Life, and we talked about ham radio and number stations, which was pretty cool. Uh, Kenny Powers says, Delaware represent. Man, are you in Delaware? Delaware is the last state I need for Worked All State, so... Somebody in Delaware, give, send me a message. Let's work out a, a QSO so I can get that thing closed out. Um, so, yeah, My Alien Life. The links for all of the podcasts that I, on, I was on is in the description. So go check that out. Also, I'll give a preface. A lot of the things I'm going to talk about and recommend on the slides that we're going to be going through and some of my, my videos and items I'll be cutting to on the workbench, I have linked to on Amazon. And you can check out the link in the description. That'll take you to my ham radio crash course, ham radio, Amazon store type thing. And, and you can see the items there. It's just a way for me to easily curate it. You don't have to. I mean, it's an affiliate link. So if you buy from me, um, it does go to help the channel, but it doesn't cost you any bit more. But I am an Amazon associate. So just an FYI on that. So keep that in mind. All right. So today we are talking about prepping and specifically bugging in with ham radio 
And what would I qualify that as? So let's flip this over here. Give me a little turn down. All right. So like I already said, you guys are most likely already prepared this minded. You you probably put up some food and, and you keep your HTs topped off. But have you kind of set a goal, like a long term goal uh, for how long you can operate? Ten days is a is a good number of days that you should try and aim for for being accessible and have usable radios, accessible comms, if you will. So I'm giving you whatever reason, doesn't matter, just assume you don't have the grid for 10 days. And the idea here is that you're going to try and not go away from home, right? You're going to try and work from home where you can. And that's kind of going to be the focus of tonight's chat. So I start things out with just receivers, receiving radios. Uh, I think that they have a major use case in where you kind of build up, right? Because there's going to be a whole lot of information that goes out over radio. We don't have to. Uh, <laughs> Good game ham radio and outdoors says we don't have to prep anything. FEMA will take care of us. That's right. Um, actually, believe it or not, FEMA. If you take any of their classes, which you can take online, and I and I actually suggest you do for emergency preparedness, these are free classes that you can take, and uh, they actually do recommend that amateur radio is a thing, and they explain how amateur radio works and that you should kind of understand it. And if you are an amateur, uh, you kind of have the capability to interoperate a bit uh, with a bit of training. But I totally do uh, recommend you check them out, even though all the the comedy of the government taking care of you. It's still true. We can have fun with that, but still a thing. Anyway, uh, so the general coverage receivers I'm a big fan of, particularly the ones that can work off of AA batteries because those are going to be really easy to kind of keep topped off. Again, you're going to be without power, and you may want to have your generators or whatever connected to appliances. So the longer that you can kind of keep something going on the air to receive is going to be good. I have a picture here showing the C-Crane Skywave single sideband. It has been kind of like my go-to radio for AM, FM, and single sideband just listening. It is an extremely usable radio. Uh, there's an honorable mention there to the Texan PL660 and the Kato brand of survival radios, which I'll, I'll flip over the camera in a second and show you one of them I've got. But the idea here is that you'd use this, right? So something happens, you don't know what, right? You've got these batteries charged up, or if you've got the Kato, it's got a solar panel. It has a crank on the side. You can keep it topped off pretty easily. And so you basically would use that to monitor different frequencies. There will be emergency broadcasts that would happen if there was an emergency or you were left without power. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can use a general coverage AM, FM, single sideband receiver for. So really quick, I'll show you this one. Uh, let me let me switch over here. So I've got a whole host of stuff that we're going to walk through today. But uh, starting out with this Kato, this Kato Voyager Pro. This guy is, what do I have him on right now? Uh, weather radio. Which, for a lot of you, depending on where you live, if you actually have weather, this could be vitally important. The advantage of this Kato... Turn off, buddy. There you go. The advantage of this Kato is you do have a solar panel on the side, which has a map light underneath and some other features. It's pretty big, though. It does have a light that you can use. Um, this thing, in comparison, here's the single, the the Skywave single sideband. It's tiny, right, in comparison. So, eh, this guy is good for utility, but I like this because it's a bit better receiver. It's smaller. It uses two AA cells and it's uh, rechargeable off of a mini USB. So that's kind of on my list of recommendations. I gave that honorable mention to the Texan PL660 because that is technically a better uh, general receiver. Now, going along with your shortwave radio, so let's say you have a shortwave radio. I really like the wind-up aerials. That... What is my dog doing in the background? I really like the wind-up aerials that you can get, the ones that just spool up. So you get a really long wire and stretch it out and get it up on the air as high as you can. I, I'm a fan of that approach for a um, a receiving radio. My dog is going to bug. The... He's getting frustrating. <laughs> 
All right, so realistically considering HTs. So um, what I mean by that is I'm generally of the mindset that if we're in a disaster situation, you're likely going to be using VHF and UHF, and primarily VHF, unless you're in a specific situation where uh, VHF isn't that great, you know, an urban environment, buildings and, and whatnot. The thing to keep in mind, though, with HTs is that you're going to have, like, low transmit range capability. So you may want this, though, right? So you're in a, an emergency situation. You just really want to talk to your local group of people, your friends, your your neighbors, you know, whatever. I won't assume why we are in an emergency situation, just that uh, we got to stay powered for 10 days. And we would like the capability potentially to have a small area of effect, a footprint of propagation, and, and maybe a larger footprint of propagation. So for me, HTs kind of fit that role. Um, and the thing to keep in mind here is that when you have things like an FT2DR or an FT3DR or a uh, Kenwood D72 or D74, those radios have all kinds of fun features on them that are going to deplete your battery, like the GPS receiver, right, that all those radios have. You're really not going to need that as much, or, or you might need it, and it's something you'd want to turn off and turn on, or you're at home, though, so you don't really need to be squawking out your APRS, or maybe you don't even want to squawk out your APRS. So keep that in mind. Uh, for me, I've been playing around with this FT4X from Yesu. That thing will run on 24 hours straight on receive, and it's been um, super effective in that capability. And, and I do have another demonstration I want to show really quick to that effect because here's the big thing. With these radios, you're going to want to keep them powered. And if there is no grid, how are you going to recharge it? And case in point with the Baofeng. The Baofeng is, is kind of uh, picky. It likes to have 9 volts, give or take, about into it to charge that battery. And the Yesu is also uh, about that as well. But I got, a, I got an interesting little hack here I want to show you. So those of you with the Yesu or the Baofeng, uh, pay attention. Yeah, actually, I'm a big fan of the UV3R too. Uh, Mike Smith just said it. Indeed. And I can explain why that is in a second. But uh, let, me, let me go ahead and, and show you back on the, uh, the overhead here. So with the... I've got these radios in their cradles, right? So here's the FT4 in its cradle, and here is the Baofeng UV5R with the uh, with the Abri antenna. So what I did was I took a power connector and hooked it up to an Andersons, right? So it's just the power lead, and I've got a 12 volt battery here. And if you read the bottom of this guy, it says Input 12 volts, output 8.4. So if you plug this guy in, you have power. And if you take your HT and connect it, you're charging. So simple, simple thing you should have on you. This is just a extra power lead. That's all it is that I attached an Anderson's to. And I took a, another set of wires, put another Anderson's on it, and used some spade connectors, automobile spade connectors. And so now you've got the capability to keep your HTs uh, topped off when you're not using them, which is an extremely important thing to do. So make sure you're, you're doing something like that because that is going to be a high value. Uh, let's see. Effect on the battery on HT from leaving it in the cradle. Oh, yeah. So I wouldn't do that. Great question. I, I assumed, you know, okay. Um, don't do that. <laughs> so... If you could, and by the way, that works for both crate, and I'll show you. You know what? I'll just show you, just so you can trust me. So the the Baofeng, right? The rumors are always with Baofengs that, um, so it says input is 10 volts, output is 8.4. Well, guess what? When you go into this, light came on, and you're charging. So we are charging the Baofeng um, off of 12 volts. I, I'm, I'm un- uh, I'm not completely solid on this one, but I can guarantee you that this one's probably fine with the Yesu. So keep that in mind. And that's what those AC adapters are doing. Those wall warts are converting from AC to DC. So by switching it up and connecting it directly into DC, that cradle, you're good to go. So uh, the comment on the cradle. I am not necessarily a fan of using the radio when it's connected to the cradle. So having a couple of radios, one on the charger 
charging up and the other that you're using is a good idea. So redundancy, right? One is none and two is one kind of thing. Well, have one on the charger and have the other one in your hand that you're using. Uh, let's see. Zach Van says, Baofeng sells a cable that has an up converter so you can use USB charge. Hey, that's very good. We'll be talking about uh, converters in a second here. So now that's for like ham radio, right? HTs. Let me flip it back over here. So that's for ham radio stuff, right? So you got HTs, you got your ham stuff covered for an HT. We'll be talking about other ham radios in a second. But if you're talking about just your neighbors, like in a disaster situation, there's nothing wrong with just going with a simple FRS radio. If you're a couple of houses down, you know, you're going to be fine to work FRS with that. And ideally, you'd give them something that can potentially charge. Now, I'm not saying you necessarily give it to everybody, but maybe have a couple of, of ideas planted for people that you might work with and hopefully encourage them to get their own equipment, right? Again, FRS radios might be a really good idea because you may not be you may not want to have a very large uh, effect of, of getting heard, right? You might want to run your HTs in low power. And these FRS radios are obviously already low power. So that would be a recommendation for me. Now, um, to, to kind of put a nutshell a little bit on the HTs and the charging we just talked about, the one thing that I also add to my kit is this watt meter. And this is my simple kind of uh, formula for figuring out like the battery capacity that you need. So... If we're looking at this, that algorithm, I'll break it down really quick. That 0.75 is percent that you're going to be receiving. So we're talking about my KX2, which uses about 0.001 amps on receive. When it's receiving, 0.001. So you multiply that by 75%, add that to the transmit time, which would be 25%, 0.25, and it draws about an amp on transmit. And then you multiply that by the hours that you think you may want to have it operating um, before you need to charge the batteries. So I said 36 hours. So what does that give me? That gives me about a 9 amp hour battery I would need to just run that straight up without having to recharge. So great. That's not that big a deal. Um, that's actually not that hard to do. Now, important thing to keep in mind, that KX2 is a QRP radio. So it's only putting out 10 watts at max power output so that's something to keep in mind the power output of your radio because so i'll i'll kind of include a radio that's really popular right now the yesu ft891 is a really good kind of entry level hf radio the the power output is 100 watts and i i don't remember what it draws i i saw mike in the chat mike may know I saw a couple of people in the chat that may know. I'll let them answer as I keep talking. But um, it has a very high draw receive, though, on when you have it in receive mode. It pulls a lot of power, much more than the uh, KX2. So what does that mean? Well, it's entirely possible that you may want to use a dedicated, yeah, one amp on receive, says K8MRD. What's, what's, the, uh, what's the draw on transmit if you're going full 100 watts? So the idea with that is, you may want to continue to use your, you know, your simple general coverage receiver with your antenna system that you would use for ham radio on receive. There's a reason why you got a single sideband general coverage receiver is that you can listen off of two double A's and be able to pull in local signals probably pretty okay. And then you could switch over to your higher powered radio if you needed to do that. Um, I have a demonstration. Uh, let me... No, we'll, we'll hold off on that right now. But, okay, there you go. Mike says, full single sideband is about 11 amps peak. So if you did that same algorithm and you just, hey, Snowman, thank you very much. I'm new. Uh, I'm new. Great videos. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Snowman. I appreciate it. I, just, I appreciate all the help and support. Thank you. So if you took that algorithm that I put, instead of 0.001, it would be 1. And if you took the, the 1 and made it 11, you're going to be using a lot of battery power to keep that 891 working, right? So that's kind of interesting, right? I'm late, so I'm curious. What delicious beverage are you drinking? I'll just remind everybody I'm drinking uh, bre chocolate for breakfast or chocolate for dinner. Anyway, it's a kind of a stout nut ale. It's very good. Mm. 
Very good. Okay. So keep that in mind. Uh, I will, you know what? I am going to show you this because I think it's a really good tool and you should probably add it to your, to your list. So here is, here is the device that you use your watt meter to kind of see what your battery's at. And these are handy because you can figure out really quickly what your draw is. Can you see this on the camera if I hold it just right? Yeah, so you can see 13.24 volts. So if I connect up our, our charger here, we'll see what that draw is. And we can calculate how much power we're going to need and be able to work with that. So... Come on now. So we're drawing uh, 3.32.33 3 amps off of this 13.9 uh, volt battery. So really handy to have, uh, really good to use on your radio when you first get them to understand what its draw is going to be like. And so you plan accordingly with the batteries that you may need to pick up. This is a Dakota Lithium battery, 12 volt, 10 amp hour battery. It's a really good battery because they're inexpensive. I think you can get this battery for under $100, which uh, for a 10 amp hour battery is pretty nice. And it comes with a charger. I don't know if you have to pay more for that, but when I bought mine, it came with a charger. Hope you're going to list out all of these devices. Boy, uh, Colo Radio, you, you missed the beginning. I said it's already linked to my Amazon store. So if you go down in the description, you don't have to buy from Amazon. You can buy them wherever you want. But it's an easy way for me to collate where to go check this stuff out. So check it out. Uh-oh, somebody said, somebody, uh, congratulations for Mike. Did Mike, uh, what did he do? The bands were full of Poda today, my last. Oh, he did a park activations. Congrats. Very good. So I would add uh, that to my list of things to have. Now, the other thing that, that was uh, mentioned, there was up converter mentioned in the chat from Zach. There's something else called a buck converter. And a buck converter will do similarly um, up or down. Um, in my case, the one I have here, I think, is only down. But what it'll do is it'll bring the voltage down off of 12 volts. So if you wanted to run multiple devices, uh, but you needed to step on the voltage a little bit so you weren't um, damaging the equipment, like, for example, if you wanted to connect a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pis are going to be really good in an emergency situation because they also sip power. They're very light on power. Russell Clark says, great channel, man. Just got my call sign this morning. Super juiced about the ham radio hobby. That's awesome. Congratulations to you, Russell Clark. I hope you get your call sign soon. And I hope you join us on Facebook and Discord. If you join us on Facebook, make sure you give a shout out when you get your license. Uh, Bill Ryland says, most of the converters create a lot of RF hash. And that is true. So Okay, going back to my uh, RFI video in the that I posted a while ago, back in January, you want to go ahead and put some ferrites on there, get those wires, because the wires basically become antennas. You want to attenuate down that RFI generation as much as possible. So very good. All right, so if the HT is your local in in relative close range line of sight comms and your mobile radio is going to be your broader comms uh, we'll have somebody call in here hopefully uh, to talk about repeaters when we get to the call-ins but the mobile radios are going to be really good for getting to repeaters that are far off and um, i don't have a lot of faith that repeaters will run for all 10 days that we will be without power in this hypothetical situation but a mobile radio is going to be able to thing that, that will get you the furthest out there. So if you want to reach out further, a mobile radio is going to be the way to go. You'll also be able to get kind of over on top of people if it's a busy channel. Not to say that you'd do that in an emergency. Everybody would be working together. But, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where you need to, uh, to do that, have the extra power. I will mention, since, it's, uh, since I listed it, the standalone antennas, I would go with a really nice uh, ground plane antenna. I happen to have the 17-foot MFJ ground plane, the Pulsar. I really like it. It's been really successful for me. I've been able to reach down to San Diego on simple FM Simplex with that thing. So I'm a big fan of that guy. Uh, 100, 100, uh, over 100 miles on FM Simplex with that without much of an issue. It wasn't full quieting, but it was really good. So I'm a big fan. 
So um, I won't go into a lot of detail on HF radios because, man, we have talked about that a lot. But basically, I wanted to say that it's going to be a standalone situation there as well. So whatever you're powering all this with, and somebody asked, are we going to talk about solar panels? We are. Whatever you're powering this with, you're going to want to distribute power. You're going to want to make sure you have enough power. So that goes back to my algorithm that I was talking about earlier, my formula for, and it's not my formula, it's a universal formula for figuring out how much power you're going to use. Um, basically, once you have that idea, do that for all the radios that you may want to have online at any one time and make sure you plus up your battery system to handle it or your generator but we'll we'll talk a little bit about that ham radio dude hey man thanks for the uh the super chat nice stream he says thank you very much i appreciate the support um <clears throat> the the thing we just mentioned about the ft891 it's going to have a high power draw the 7300 i think has one amp power draw as well and receive in fact i'm looking at it right now it's on and it's 1.2 amps right now it's power draw on 13.7 watts i'm sorry volts of uh, power that it's drawing at from my power supply. So going back to what I said earlier, it's entirely reasonable to have a single sideband general coverage receiver, something that runs off of batteries, like that PL660 would be really, really good in this capacity, and just connect that on a switch to your main antenna on your main radio. So you just are receiving on your PL660, if you hear something you need to, to do, you switch it over to your main radio, turn that on so you can make a, tr a call or whatever you need to do. Uh, Logic44, thank you for the support, says need to get used to the new stream time. <laughs> the new stream time is 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is 0100 UTC time on Saturdays. Thanks for adjusting your schedule appropriately. I appreciate it. <laughs> and sorry, you're not that late. We're, we're barely halfway in. Okay, so talking about switches. So I, I'm going to reiterate what I just said because we're, we're bugging in. So we have the capability to run multiple antennas. For HF, I recommend an Envis antenna and then something else like a, uh, a higher gain antenna or a dipole that's higher up. And what do I mean for those who've never heard of Envis before? Basically, it's an antenna that is going to be lower to the ground the best antenna is generally a dipole that is less than one quarter wave above the ground. So if it's a 20 meter dipole, one quarter of that wavelength above the ground, less than. And what that'll do is send most of your RF up and then come back down. And that is going to give you a wide propagation space in and up to 300, 400 miles, which is going to be great for working HF bands when you're in close and you're in this disaster area type of thing. Uh-oh, my wife is in the chat. She says, wait, how many antennas? So I would say two antennas for HF, NVIS, and whatever your general coverage antenna would be, whether it's a dipole or a vertical or possibly a beam of some kind. But an NVIS is going to be nice when you're working in, in close. Uh, that antenna, is uh, that switch is uh, pretty loaded. There is a dip my my hex beam is on that, my 40 meters on that, my N fed, and the one at the very bottom is the Christmas lights, which are still connected. <laughs> I like the uh, switches. I mentioned this switch in particular, which is the Alpha Delta, because that center spot on that Alpha Delta is shorting it to ground, which is really nice if you are in a place with weather or perhaps you are without power because of weather and you need to make doubly sure that you're not frying your radio equipment for a lightning strike, for instance, you can drop that thing to ground and hopefully you can protect your radio. So that's a, that's a good thing to have. I, I would recommend that. And now outbound of that, that center connector is actually the outbound connector that goes into another switch that I have my primary radio and then a, a coax, an open coax lead that I can connect a second radio or a general coverage receiver. Why not add, why not adjustable antennas? Uh, where was the question? Zaphael says, why not adjustable antennas? Sure, you can have adjustable antennas. Hey, you don't have to do what I'm doing. I'm just saying it's a really good idea to have a, an antenna switch um, because an Envis antenna is not going to be like other antennas. It's going to be lower to the ground. 
And that lower to the groundness is only going to get you up and back down. It's going to get you 300 to 400 miles propagation from your home QTH, which is your home location, and a other antenna, your standard, I want to get out as far as I can antenna, it's not going to be as great for NVIS, particularly if it's a vertical. Verticals are, are rubbish for NVIS since there's a big null right at the top, so you're sending nothing up. All right, so considering solar, somebody asks. Uh, so yes, solar panels are cheap on Amazon. The, the panel that I have linked here and the panel that is on the Amazon list is like $88 for a 100-watt 12-volt panel. Now, um, you're going to want to worry some about your charge controller. Charge controllers have a tendency to put out a ton of noise. So go with something like uh, Genesun is a kind of well-respected brand with amateur radio operators. They operate in uh, fairly low noise, but you may still get some of it. And so make sure with all those wires that you are using the appropriate RFI tackling methods, which again, go watch my RFI video if you have not. Uh, MPPT charge controller, Mr. Creative is yelling in the chat. Uh, sure, just make sure you go with something that's low noise and do your research on that one. Mm. Very good beer. Um, some notes on that too. Uh, let me switch this back over. I am a big fan of these guys, these MFJ Anderson breakout boxes. So if you have a charge controller, you're going to have a load connection like these little spade connectors, kind of like spade, loop connectors. And so these are all going to be 12 volts out. You could have a series of, this is switchable, by the way, the first three are on off on the switch with 40 amps total and four through eight are 20 amps total. So you could run uh, your, your charger for your, for your HTs. You could have your Raspberry Pi with a buck converter in there. You could do all kinds of stuff uh, to be able to connect different devices, different radios on here. And that you just connect to the wall, get it grounded with the appropriate lug, and you can distribute power. So you don't need to have multiple connections out of your solar panel. You would go directly off of one of these devices. This is the MFJ 1126 which is a distributed power box. They also have smaller options if you're working off of a smaller kind of uh, smaller budget or maybe not too many radios, right? So this is the uh, 1106. It's the six-way desktop, which is six Andersons. This is the input and then six output Andersons. Now, keep in mind, you're going you're gonna to drain your batteries pretty quickly if you connect all this stuff up. So I'm a, uh, I'm a big fan of knowing what your draw power is. I'm going to repeat that a lot. I have been repeating it a lot. But it's important to understand because it's, it's really important to keep in mind. Now, I will note, generally these guys go on the roof. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So battery solution, backup battery solution. So there are a couple of battery packs out on Amazon. I am currently using this Jackery battery inverter that connects to a 110, uh, that should be 100 watt. It's a 100 watt, 18 volt uh, panel, and it's portable. It has a 16 amp hour battery. It has USB ports. It outputs AC, and it does DC via cigarette lighter. And I purchased a DC cigarette lighter to Anderson's cable with really nice big gauge wires. And I used this with my 7300 and it worked fantastic. So I plug this into the cigarette port. This goes into something like my distribution panel here and I can plug in all kinds of devices off of that for DC. And then if I need to, although I'm, I'm gonna try not to in an emergency situation is have a bunch of AC devices, but the USB is nice for Raspberry Pis. Home solar needs a large floated lead acid battery. Mine has a 370 amps, also AGM golf cart batteries. So Bill Ryland, um, good point. If you have the capability to get some good, again, we're, we're bugging in, so it's not a big deal if you have a big floated battery system. Um, those are going to be really heavy. AGMs are going to be on the heavier side too, but it's okay because we're not going to be moving them around. You're going to be at your home QTH. The only thing to keep in mind with all this stuff is charge controllers can get um, 
you need to pay attention to which ones you're using because they can get a little noisy. So keep that in mind. Home solar, you can also use lithium. You can. Uh, you're going to pay a lot more for lithium, though. Uh, just keep that in mind. Now, for me in California, I get a lot of days of sunshine. So I may be able to go relatively low on my batteries and then charge back up and do that for 10 days. Some of you may not be. So it's worth it to consider that, uh, particularly how efficient your solar panels are, and handle that accordingly. Now, uh, I will say if you deal with weather where you're not going to get 100% efficiency or you know as best you can with your panels, that you may want to plus up your batteries. Just so everybody's listening and, and watching understands, you're not going to want to use car batteries. Don't go get car batteries. You're going to want to use deep cycle batteries are always what you want when you're running solar and connecting to it. However, my little Jackery setup works fine for a lot of situations. 16 amp hours is not a lot by any means, but um, that would be more for like a portable operation like POTA. I would have more batteries strung together in series to, to keep them you know topped off. But again, I'm also not going to be running a high power station all the time. I would only be using it in specific cases. Uh, generators. So I have, I, I put this generator up because that's the one I have, which is the uh, Yamaha, the EF2000. I like this generator more than I like the Honda generators because it has a fuel petcock switch for turning off the fuel tank. It has an external fuel gauge, which the Honda doesn't have. And there's just a couple more features to the Yamaha for the same price, basically, that I think make it a better generator. They can also get a tri-fuel kit that will work with this generator so you can convert it from gasoline to propane or natural gas, and it will work really well for that. Uh, I would recommend inverter type uh, generators because inverters are going to control the throttle appropriately depending on the load that you've put on it, which if it's just a radio system and if it's a lower powered radio system or you're just charging batteries, you probably won't make a ton of noise, but hey, you know, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, good game ham radio outdoors says, believe it or not, the Harbor freight inverter generator is solid. I have heard that before. So I fine. That's good. Cause I think that's like 400 bucks. If that for the same capability, pretty much as the Yamaha, which is pretty good. And of course you can always buy these generators used if they don't have an hour meter on them though. And you don't know how beat to hell they are. Uh, you're, you're taking your own life in your hands in that case, but I mentioned it already. I use the Anderson breakout panels for distributing power off my batteries uh, and the solar panel. So now we've mentioned all this like technical how-to, the technical things that I, I would recommend, but it's possible that you, depending on the situation, again, no power. I'm not going to assume why the power has gone. You can make the decision on, on why you'd be preparing to be down for 10, uh, 10 days. Um, you may want to keep a low profile, right? I've got a big old antenna on my roof. Uh, I've got multiple big antennas on my roof. Not really keeping a low profile. If you throw a couple of solar panels on there, not low profile. People are going to be looking for things. They're going to be looking for things like antennas. And, and for everybody in the chat, for anybody that's done any kind of prepping, um, have you ever heard when SHTF happens, I'm coming to your house? I'm sure you all have. And so maybe... Maybe <laughs> you want to keep a low profile. You may not want to have people knowing what what you uh, what you've got going on. So uh, this is my my roof uh, with that big uh, stand on it and the hex beam. It is not discreet. It is not. <laughs> it's very very in the open. So you may want to consider a portable setup. You may want to consider wire antennas or covert HOA antennas, which we talked about uh, in the past. I did a live stream on covert antennas. Ken Sweeney says, thank you, DEAC3DH. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate the support and the super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, for your solar panels, there's no reason they have to be on the roof. Uh, a lot of times your roof line is raked in a way that you get a pretty good coverage to a southern exposure, which is kind of where you want to be with a solar pass. Uh, depending on where you live. That's what I do. But this is the uh, Jackery panel, the 100 watt panel. You just throw that on the ground and it will do generally okay. And then it's in your backyard and you don't don't necessarily have you don't really have a problem. Uh, Bill 
Ryland says inverter generators may be blown up in an EMP situation. So yeah, it, it depends on what you're prepping for. I'm just saying 10 days of no power. If you are worried about EMP, then you're going to have to plan for your own EMP protection. But you're going to have that problem no matter what whenever you pull these systems out of the galvanized trash cans that you're using as uh, Faraday cages, for example. But I understand the point. Now, the one of the takeaways that uh, I will leave this with, and then we can take some calls and do some other fun stuff, is don't leave your radio on a speaker. You want to have a headset connected to it. You know, noise travels, and if there's no power and it's really quiet and people don't have an idea of what's going on and they're concerned that they're out of, of touch with society, with other humans, they may, <laughs> they may hear your radio if you've got it turned up because maybe you're a little hard of hearing or whatever, you got it cranked up. Get some headsets. Figure out a way to keep it quiet. Run quiet. This is going back to keeping a low profile. So make sure you have a good headset. Make sure you keep it quiet. All right, so operating during an emergency. So the, ay, 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 the kids are crying. If my wife is still in the chat room, can you please make the children stop quiet crying? She's She was commenting, so <laughs> hopefully she can see it. Uh, Trevor Robertson says he found an antenna that is disguised as an antenna flagpole. Yes, we talked about that in the covert antenna, so make sure to check that out. So when you're operating in an emergency, keep it efficient. You want your communications to be um, simple, compact, and tight so that you get the information across as clearly as possible with not a lot of jargon or, or complexities to it. Make it simple. And that orange side there, to prepare for an emergency or prepare for something like this, you may want to get involved with local nets. And a net is going to you know, have a call-in section, and they're going to take emergency traffic. There's a whole system to it. And as Mr. Creative already posted, there's an Aries traffic system. If you can find an Aries group in your area, consider joining them because you're going to learn about proper protocol for doing transfers. But again, you're not going to be prohibited from handling traffic during an emergency if you don't know these. But try to familiarize yourself with it if you can. I, I always mention it in, in preparation type videos, the wilderness protocol, because I think it's really important to understand and uh, really important to, to do, not just during an emergency, but all the time. The wilderness protocol is basically monitoring the simplex frequencies that you have available on your radio. Most of you will have 146.520, which is the two meter national simplex frequency. And the idea is every three hour, hours, starting at 7 a.m., turn it on and monitor wilderness, uh, sort of wilderness protocol for anyone calling. And you can, you know, tune in, listen for a little while and say, you know, give your call sign KI6NAZ. I'm monitoring for the wilderness protocol. If there's anyone that, you know, any traffic to, to send, I'm listening now. And that's... Great for just when there's an emergency, you're out where there is no cell phone coverage. You basically will have somebody that says, hey, I need help, whatever, and then you can try and help them at that point. But then when you're in the suburbs, you can use this to just listen all the time on these frequencies. Tell your neighbors or, or help them get programmed on radios to listen on these frequencies in case there's a call that comes in. So the expanded wilderness protocol, if you have consistent power, right, if you have some way, like we already talked about, you've got solar panels, you've got generators, you've got big old batteries that'll keep you running, just leave a, just leave a radio on 146520 all the time and just see if you can hear someone or if they need help or whatever when you're in an emergency. You can do it now. Uh, simplex calling frequency is a great time or a great frequency to just pick up QSOs if you want to work FM simplex. And again, that's just the frequency that you'd use and the, the mode of operation that you would use if you were on like a Baofeng or that Yesu FT4X or any HT radio or mobile radio for that matter for picking up calls. 
Um, otherwise, if you're trying to save power, then just listen every hour or so, and that way you're saving your battery, but you're still you know, getting an important amount of, of listening time so that you can hear people as they call. And it was a reminder, you're gonna listen for, what was it, monitor, uh, for five minutes. So at the beginning of the hour, every, at 7 a.m., every three hours, you're gonna listen for five minutes and then turn the radio off. And that'll allow you to protect your battery. Now this one, um, by the way, I'll post all my pa uh, I'll post all the slides to Patreon, and there'll be op there'll be a public post link is in the description for my Patreon. It's open to the public. I'll post them there so you can get the links and you can have these copy of the slides if you want to look at them, use them, whatever. Just let me know if you're going to use it in a video or or take it to um, take it to a another ham radio club or something like that. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Okay. Uh, did I miss something up? No. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, so the ICS forms are what I link here, and these are FEMA forms that there's a ton of them that you can get online, and you may want to print a bunch out that you keep in a notebook or stack of them. In particular, you want the instance report or the activity log. And that way you can take some key notes about the radio operator. It doesn't have to be your call sign. It can be anything, just some details of information for something that's going on. So if you're monitoring with your mobile radio or you're monitoring HF, you would note the band, the frequency of operation, what happened when you were listening, um, various details about what's going on uh, that you keep track of and you keep notes of. Big shout out to the IC7300, the HF radio that I mentioned earlier, and a lot of other HF radios do this too, but you have the capability to record the QSO as a two-part like audio file. So you could, in an emergency situation, if you were taking traffic, if you were doing wilderness protocol or whatever, you could copy or save that audio file to the local memory card or memory system on the radio and for later use or whatever. So for me, I have a 64 gig memory card in my 7300. And if I hear a bunch of OMs arguing on 80 meters, I will often hit the record button. But in an emergency situation, it's really good to have that capability as well so that you can actually uh, go back later, replay it off the 7300 if you need to in case you missed something that was important or that you needed to have. So there you go. All right, so that's my talk on bugging in with ham radio. If I didn't address your questions, um, I can take them now. Otherwise, call in, which we're going to take the call in number. There it is. Uh, you can call in. You can post in the chat now or join us in the Discord after that, and I will take the call. I am going to uh, refill my beer while you guys figure out uh, who's going to call in first. And just hang on the line, because I will uh, I will take your call. Let's see. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, we've already got a caller. Okay, hang on, caller. Priorities. i got to fill up my beer. Okie dokie. All right, caller's still there. All right, caller, what's your name? Hey, it's Evan, KJ7BRE. KJ7BRE. How's it going? Pretty good. What What brings your... Uh, why are you calling today? What's up? Well, um... I uh, came to talk about the repeaters right and uh, emergency use. Go um, for it. So, okay. Uh, yeah, I got some notes. Um, so, yeah, so repeaters and amateur radio. Uh, some things you were saying earlier is uh, about running the repeater during an emergency and, like, uh, how long they'll actually stay online. Yeah. And, you know, it. Uh, you probably want to check with the, the person who owns the system. Uh, the, for your local area and see if they're running like battery backup and generator systems. 
because uh, you know some of our some of our sites have battery backups that run from anywhere 100 amp hours to 500 amp hours, and so you know some counties don't have any battery backup or some have automatic generators. And it's really good. You should be able to email them and uh, figure that out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and, generally, uh, though, what do you think? Uh, I, I would assume that most repeaters don't have much of a robust system to stay on the air for long. What do you think about that? Um, well, yeah, like I said, it, it really has to do with uh, who owns the system and what they're putting into it. But uh, I found uh, most systems to be pretty robust. Um, what do you mean, though? But, you know, like really more depends. than 10 days? Like more than 10 days? Yeah, more than 10 days. It, mm. it really depends how much uh, the person's using it, though. Um, mm. You know, how much the, the community's using it. And, um, you know, I... I do know that uh, there's uh, people who, uh, you know, there's teams of people, uh, to, uh, you know, technicians who will go out and fix them if they do go down in those emergencies. Because, you know, a lot of people are stuck with uh, HTs and can't really get away from that. Uh, so that's true. You know, maybe they don't have the space. So that that's true. But um, my general thoughts are, and, and again, I'm in Southern California, so most of our repeaters are on mountaintops, and they don't generally have uh, generators. They have power lines. And if the power goes down, they're done. There may be a solar panel or two, but they may be able to run in low power mode. But that's not really sustainable 24 hours a day. I assume that they may get into the evening, but then they're going to come down. You you disagree, though? You think that they're going to withstand uh, the the long-term power outage? Yeah, we've, we will... I'm um, just saying, you know, personally, from my experience, uh, we've had power outages. I, I'm up here in Oregon, and we've, uh, it, we're out in Tillamook. We've had a major power outage that uh, happened, I think, for uh, four days or so. And we uh, we kept online the entire time with our batteries, and we didn't really wear uh, – our, our batteries didn't really go down too much. And we have uh, – I'm pretty sure we have 500 amp hours up there. But, um, you know, they, they stayed pretty robust for that amount of time. But, you know, it really depends what other people are running. And, you know, we really – I'm just saying the general, uh, like, people in amateur radio, the general operator probably doesn't have access to the site and doesn't really know what's up there. So that's why I would always recommend contacting the person who owns the system. Mm -hmm. So um, l let's go back a second. You were talking – how long were you running without power with that repeater? Four days. Four days. And you said you had how many amp hours in the repeater? 500. 500. And what was the power output on the repeater? Um, I'm pretty sure we have it running at 7 watts out. Oh, oh 7 watts. Oh, okay, yeah. so that's not a lot of power. That I'm not surprised you could that's keep. not. Okay. Mm. But when you when you have it really high, you know, that covers, that covers um, you know, 100, uh, almost 100 miles. Yeah. In any direction. Yeah, uh, that's my that's my assumption though is that you'd have to throttle back on the repeater power significantly to be able to to stay online for an appreciable amount of time, and then give your batteries the recharge time it needs via solar. Yeah, yeah, and you know when we're speaking about this site, also uh, there's other factors like uh, we're uh, this site is uh, we we weren't really uh, using our batteries for that time. Uh, there was also like a generator up there that automatically kicked in. So we used, uh, you know, our, our batteries first and switched over to back to the AC mm -hmm. lines uh, with their thing once, uh, once uh, you know, if we needed to. Because uh, there's uh, the gas company was the people who own the site and they have microwave equipment to shut down their gas valves up there. Mm -hmm. And so we have a tower right next to it, but we're in the same building. So uh, they, uh, they have uh, a propane powered uh uh generator that has like six huge propane cylinders on it and uh i think they said something like they can have that thing running for like two weeks or something before they have to refill it mm -hmm. yeah yeah there you go i mean so hey, don't get me wrong I'm, I'm sure it could work but you're you're throttling back the power a lot like i know my local repeater is 100 watts uh, and I can clearly hit it uh, about 60 miles line of sight from the repeater uh, on a 5-watt handy talkie. But if you dial back that to 7 watts, I don't know if I would be as effective. So I, I don't know. I, maybe a bit. But, you know, I, I assume all things are different when you're in uh, 
you know, an emergency situation. So, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, though. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, you do have the point with the whole power output. Um, and uh, there is actually uh, repeaters like um, uh, the uh, Motorola MSF 5000 uh, repeaters and also I think the Yaesu, uh DR2X okay. uh, have uh, the ability when the power goes out uh, to sense the ba- uh, that it's done that. And when it's, it has a battery input, backup battery input, it mm-hmm. will switch its power level to a predetermined level so mm-hmm. you don't uh, uh, wear down as fast. Uh, this is all true. And we've got some people in the chat that are, uh, you know, they're working on different radio towers in Oregon. They say they have propane diesel generators. You mentioned diesel generators as well and backup. So all of that is acceptable. And there are multiple use cases where that's going to be fine. And again, somebody said, if uh, if people just use radio discipline, 500 amp hours would be enough for a week. You're right, except I don't think anyone can assume people are going to use good radio discipline uh, if it was a true, true emergency. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? Because you were, Sid, you were out of power for four days, right? Yeah. How, what was the repeater traffic like? Were people panicking? Yeah. <laughs> There was, yeah. uh, there was quite a quite a lot of people transmitting, but um, it, it calmed down after the first uh, like it ha- the power outage was kind of at maybe about seven p.m. and mm-hmm. uh, we we sent uh, you know we we knew it happened because we have uh, a telemetry system up there, so we are we're all tuning in, and uh, it was kind of chaotic the first night. We probably had maybe. 30 people and like a round table kind of thing happening. But after maybe about mm, three hours or so, everything calmed down. Is that because their HTs all died because they didn't have them charged and they didn't have a way to keep them going? Um, not exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm just is, kidding. People I'm on kidding. there who had power. So. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, but okay, no, that okay. I know whenever we lose power, people hop on the local repeater. Like, is this it? Is this uh, the end of the world as we know it? Is it time to uh, to break out the uh, the heavy stuff and and get get to business? I, I... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, right on. Okay, is there any other notes that you had uh, you had taken down during the the live stream? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I was uh, saying uh, the um, AGM is a really safe thing for indoors, also for people who are looking for batteries. Great point. Wonderful and, point. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the flooded uh, and, the flooded um, lead is is good, but the AGMs are 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 nice too, and those are those have lots of good use cases for solar. I feel and it's a good battery to use in yeah. that case. Yeah, and for the people who don't know uh, what AGM are is, uh, they actually have like a gas inside of them. So if they got punctured or something, they're not going to spray an acid all over. They're just going to off gas, and uh, they're going to safely do so and not explode mm-hmm. on you. Like Indeed. other batteries can. I, uh, also, you probably saw me put in the MPPT comment about the MPPT charge controllers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't, um, you, why don't you mention them? Because I know that Genesun is always yeah. a, a, a well-loved uh, charge controller. But go ahead. What's the MPPT? Yeah, so um, I forget exactly what it stands for. But um, MPPT charge controllers, um, let me see it real quick. Um, that's they, a type of controller, like a, right? A battery, that's that's not a brand. Type of controller. Yeah. Yes, so it's maximum PowerPoint tracking, and uh, they essentially are a more efficient charge controller for uh, their charging side, not the load side. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, you know, there's less losses because you think of like when you when you have a solar panel, it's it's taking maybe uh, let's uh, this is just theoretical, but say it's putting 30 volts into the solar charge controller, and it does 50 volts max, and you're charging a 12 volt battery with this. Right. Uh, the losses of that, you have to down down step that. You have to step it down. Right. Uh, there's less losses with these MPPTs. Uh, it's uh, it's mostly about the way they charge. Uh, the other side is PWM chargers, mm-hmm. pulse width modulation, and uh, they're not as efficient, but they'll still work. Um, so, I also will say there's a lot of like cheap Chinese PWM chargers out there too. The uh, the Genesun charge controllers are uh, MPPT. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I haven't checked out the Genesun ones. No, uh, they are. They actually just did a, oh, okay. they were on the ham radio workbench podcast, which by the way, 
Another good podcast to go check out. I haven't been on that yet, but hey, guys, if you want me to hop on your show, I will. Um, they had the, the creator of Jenison on there. They did a whole, like, over an hour talking to him. It was fascinating. So the the deep dive nerd stuff that I don't cover um, for, like, charge controllers, like, that level of detail was super, super in uh, on that podcast. So if you're interested in charge controllers, go watch that. It was really, really good. That was to everybody, not just you, yeah. <laughs> Evan. <laughs> but, you <know. laughs> um, yeah, I also saw some comments. Uh, I wrote down the comments. and I Oh, man. You're... Them. They were kind of interesting. We're just going to have you call <laughs> into the like show all the time. Note. I have a yellow notepad here. I have a yellow notepad here. <laughs> you can call into the show anytime you want, Evan, and, and bring the... <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Bring the notepad. So um, someone uh, asked about DMR in emergencies. Oh, good. And yeah, thought, yeah, we should I, talk I about that. that to be a really interesting, I found that to be a really interesting question mm -hmm. because they have servers. Um, and and those, if those servers are down, then the DMR system's down. So uh, DMR would really, uh, to my perspective, yes. would only work in simplex at that point. Uh, you, you, are, you are so right. Um, we should – God, I, I, I need to do a whole video on this, and I, I actually need to go <laughs> – I need to go back and redo a video that I did. I, I need to do a better job at it. So I, I'm, I'm saying this right now. I, I screwed up on a video and I got to fix it. But okay. So yeah, DMR is great um, for simplex because digital is going to stay relatively flat and then die off versus analog is going to kind of taper off as you get away from the, the transmitting station. So DMR is really good for simplex, but it's not going to be great if um, if you're dependent on some kind of connection to the server system for the talk groups that you're running. That's going to be a problem uh, in a in a you know grid down situation. You may not be able to get out using uh, DMR. However, D Star. Um, I'm, the more I'm learning about D Star, which you know it's the one of the older digital modes, and I and I don't really know it well enough. D Star uses kind of a mesh system. Uh, so if those repeaters, right, if you have a repeater, we, we just talked about repeaters being robust enough to stay online, and they, if they are D-Star repeaters, they could technically have the capability in them to mesh together all their different nodes, and you would be able to communicate in and out, which is pretty impressive. And so I, I need to do a longer deep dive on that. Yeah, yeah. And also a similar thing with Fusion also. System Fusion works really well for Simplex. Uh, well, what you said about the tapering off point, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, versus analog. System Fusion has the same thing, but, you know, System Fusion has servers, but, um, you know, uh, it's more the C4 FM side of it that I would be talking about at that it, point. Yeah, but uh, System Fusion suffers from the same problem as uh, DMR does in this case. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm with you on that one. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, auto patch. I, I brought that up at the very beginning. Um, yeah, this is crazy. So patch, go ahead. Are there yeah. still repeaters out there that have auto patches? I yes, I have. I have a repeater here right behind me within reach that has auto patch. On oh, but it. <laughs> but not not uh, not repeaters that are equipped with auto patch. You could put it up there if you needed to. Is what you're saying? Uh, no, these are equipped with auto patch. They they're equipped with them and, and active. And are you in the the you're in the repeater shack right now with the auto patches? Is what you're saying? Oh uh, no, I mean I have a repeater that runs here at the house. So any, anybody that's watching an auto patch, if you're if you're not old uh, like I am, an auto <laughs> patch is a repeater device that would allow you to basically key up your HT and then using the number pad dial a phone number the auto patch would connect to the phone system and you could talk over the phone. Think of uh, what we would do before cell phones existed. That's what the auto patch did. So anyway, go ahead with the auto patch. Yeah. Um, so some things about auto patch, I don't know if you'll talk about this in a video. It'd be a cool thing, but um, it's completely legal for someone who doesn't have an amateur radio license to my, to my knowledge mm -hmm. uh, to uh, call in through the auto patch uh, because the other person has full control. Mm -hmm. as the control operator and the call sign is through the repeater so um with this also um if you're calling 911 through an auto patch keep in mind that you if you're in a different county because that's completely possible yep. you're gonna have to ask the 911 operator to transfer you to the proper county that you're in um that's that's the one thing about using auto patches 
I can also point out that um, some auto pets, is, I, I don't know of any, but I've been having this thought for like the past year. What if we can take an iridium sat phone? Oh, here we go. On an auto pet. Oh, that is an idea, sir. I, when you said iridium, immediately, I, oh man, that's a good idea. <laughs> that's yeah, yeah. I, I thought about it. Uh, could you imagine the uh, the call or the the bill that came comes in the mail when uh, you, <laughs> somebody somebody oh made an iridium God. call and they didn't can't, oh they didn't turn God. it off. We left the iridium running Ooh. for uh, for twenty eight hours. <laughs> Uh, oh somebody, God. somebody asked in the chat, "What does my shirt say?" Uh, it says Hertz, Armstrong, Marconi, Morse, and Taylor. Uh, this was a custom shirt that I made <laughs> for me. I, I think I wore it at uh, Dayton. Yeah. Oh man, that was good stuff. So Evan, thank you for calling in. Yeah. Was there, was there anything else, or is that? Um, I. The only other thing I have is that you said about using cigarette lighters. Yes, and uh, I don't know if you saw my comment in there, but I did not. Uh, be careful when pulling the the amps uh, through the cigarette lighter, because if you're using HF on a cigarette lighter in a car, you don't know what the internal wiring is, and you could totally burn up the internal wiring on your car. You know, okay, so this is uh, this is a long running, I feel, urban legend of ham radio. I don't think that's necessarily a problem i'm sure there are uh certain cars that have low gauge wiring that or sorry large gauge wiring that that's too small that may have a you know melt or short or whatever but i'm not that worried about that i'm less concerned about that yeah. in today's day and age yeah but anyway yeah well the, like if you're running multiple mu multiple equipment you know multiple radios or something on a, on a single i should that's, test that's kind of my point i should that. test that i could see if i can blow up this uh this inverter battery just plug this into an anderson's uh like breakout box and just see how many radios i can plug into it and get them running at the same time you're giving me a good man this is a good call evan thank you, you can, like i said you can call in anytime get them all transmitting okay. mm. yeah. i like it good and, stuff uh, man. and then yeah, and uh, so uh, we you were talking about APRS and messaging, which I thought an interesting thing. You can totally use that for messaging, even if the servers are down. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, so uh, I didn't go into that a lot. So a lot of things that we covered in today's video, I'll, I'll try and integrate links for those that are watching after uh, uh, the fact. We've covered digital modes like JSA call. JSA call is going to be wonderfully useful during an emergency situation, and that interoperates with APRS. I mentioned uh, HTs and the capability of sending messages with APRS. I personally feel like if you're in an emergency situation for more than 10 days, you're going to be using voice, uh, probably mostly voice. But you're, you may use digital if you want to get out to loved ones, maybe, that are outside of your area of disaster effect, maybe. Uh, so it's always good to have those capabilities. But I, I was figuring we're mainly going to be on voice. That's my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just had one more thought while we're here is uh, also the IRLP and Echolink stuff is going to be down. When I was thinking about the DMR server stuff, you know, yep. we're not going to yep. have that either. Yep. Yes. Yeah, that's kind of all I have for you, though. Man, that was great. <laughs> you 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 definitely took some show notes. So I appreciate that. You're obviously uh, passionate about this uh, topic. Yeah, it's it's definitely something I've thought about. And you know, working working with re repeaters, which is like a you know a major part in all the people using HTs. And you know, I'm in a dense urban environment. You know, Portland, Oregon. There's lots of people here, and uh, you know, lots of uh, people who are interested in emergency communications. It, you know, it's it's re really good to have a robust system that's going to be able to run in these kind of situations, and it's something I think about a lot when we're up at this, uh, up at our sites and stuff. It's like, oh, is this going to, is it, you know, this thing's dangling or whatever? Is this going to actually like break down in the the earthquake we're expecting and all that stuff? You know, right. like uh, you know those kind of thoughts. Very good. Yeah. No, I hear you. I like it. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bid you a. Uh... A good night. Uh, if you join us on the Discord, we can talk a little bit more there. But Evan, thank you very much for calling in. Those were great comments and, and great thoughts you had. Awesome. Thanks. And thanks for letting me call. You have a good night there. Hey, do you have a YouTube? Your logo is really uh, familiar yeah, I to me. Do, do you want to pimp your YouTube? Go for it, man. Uh, sure. It's uh, it's Mr. Creative. It's spelled C-R-E-H-I-V-E. And uh, I'm over there... Uh, 
Uh, I haven't posted a video in a while, but I'm uh, I'm trying to trying to get more subscribers to start making more videos and all that stuff. That, so. That's what I thought. I, I I saw your logo and I was like, it's the green circle with the little the wave the the frequency wave on it. I was like, oh, I know that. The so, telescope wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> send me um I. I I, I think I'm subscribed to you, but send me a message on Discord or somewhere, and I'll and I'll add you to the uh, the description of the video. So thanks for your comments and your call-in. It was really, really, I think, a value-added call-in. Thank you very much for doing that. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. All right, man. Take it easy. See ya. A uh, big thank you to AD6 DM Dennis. What's up, buddy? Appreciate the support with the five dollars and fifty-six cents. That's my uh, one of my favorite. I'm I'm more of a seven six two guy. Uh, I'm not asking you to spend more money, but that's more my my uh, my jam. All right. Well, uh, nobody else is calling in, and that's okay because we're pretty much past the hour. I hope I got most of the comments in there. Um, I will say going to uh, JSA call. So. It, the FT8 is great, right? We do that for lots of communication, um, for making contacts. But you can't really send information back and forth. You can't actually chat with people. You can't tell them where the, where you're at. Um, obviously, we're we're bugging in, so we're not um, we're not doing going out and telling people where we're at. We're not having to report a location because we're home. And Zach brings up another good point, WinLink. WinLink is email system, um, over-the-air email system, right? I did the video that I did with the Modern Rogue is using WinLink. You can definitely do that when you have an emergency situation and you are home. The Invis antenna, being able to shoot your RF directly up and back down, going to be really effective in close for WinLink. So absolutely. Bill Semp, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Oh, Don got it. <laughs> Don, I wasn't asking for it, but thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, 762. 762 by 49, 762 by 54R. Um, all very, very good uh, 762 numbers to follow. Man, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for... Oh, <laughs> 223 and Radio Dude. <laughs> oh, hopefully you all know what those mean, but if you don't, that's okay. We're going to leave it at that because I think it's funny. Uh, hey, oh, there it is. Vineland uh, Alchemist. Greetings from Nagoya, like Nagoya the Antenna, Japan. Kick-ass channel. Thank you very much. Appreciate you watching. Someone needs to do 22 cents. <laughs> 22 is probably also my favorite, so I would say that too. I appreciate that. All right, before this gets too crazy, I'm going to wrap her up. So let me flip her over. And give my big shout out to the patrons. Uh, I will be posting the patron picks vote uh, very soon here this weekend. And that is going to be the show next Saturday. Uh, right? Next Saturday? Or do I have another week? I think it's... Wait. Oh, no. Wait. Nope. It's next week. Wait. No, I'm not. Wait. God, I'm losing my mind. Uh, no, so good. The vote's going to go out this weekend, and we can vote, and then net the following week will be the Patrons Picks episode, which is always the first Saturday of the month. So uh, that is going to be a lot of fun because the patrons get to pick the show topic. Anyway, want to give a big thank you to Jason Brown, Jason Siebert, David Dancero, Danny Miller, Wesley Magyar, Barbara Schrock, Evan Hartman, Ev Mark Fields. Reminder, we're going to the Discord after this, so follow the link, hopefully posted by the admins in the chat. Brad Snyder, Dennis Dunderdale, Garrett Larson, 86DM Dennis, who is in the chat. Thank you, Dennis. The Wyoming Ham, where was he at? Uh, I didn't get his check-in today. I need his, uh, He needs to check in. Uh, Randall Hinsley, Dennis Mickelson, Michael Hunt, George Gaini, Andy, Kenny Miyamoto, Ron Thorson, Ken Hall, Sean Bales, KJ7ITX, Ur Jurgetchevich, Jurgetchevich, that's it, uh, Rob Zares, Devin B. Hedge, Mark Chase, Raymond Cracker, Geraldo Kelso, Rob K8BCR, Lee Carroll, Michael Keerley, Steve Baker, uh, Corey Sheldon, Brad Nadal, Stephen Hunt, Connor Carroll, Mark Marusen, Mike Hearley, Harald Carpenter. The Brew Crew got into a, a second beer here, which normally I only do one. Uh, Stephen Hunter, Justin Rao, Stephen Carduz, Richard Smith, Hercules, KC1LZR, John Flower, Stephen Blandford, Tom Wright, Bill McCarty. Good game, Ham Radio. He was definitely in the chat. 
uh, David Gerald, Mike Deards, Nic- Mike, uh, Nicholas Dubé, Michael Iafreto, Jace Ravenfield, Masi Madi, Daniel Sullivan, Michael Hunt, Jason Legg, Jonathan Williams, and new patron, Andy Cowley. Thank you very much. <laughs> Somebody's posting a bunch of emojis. Hmm. That's very funny. That is a lot of emojis. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Emoji Man. (laughs) Well, okay. Guys, that is pretty much going to do it for today. That was a lot of fun. Um, We are going to go to the uh, Discord after chat, so I hope you follow us there. As always, if you have not already, please click subscribe. I live stream every Saturday, 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which is 0 100 hours UTC. And uh, let's see, what else? Facebook. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and the Discord. And what else? I had something else I wanted to say, but I think that's going to do it. As always, thank you. Big thank you. I appreciate all the support. That'll do it. I will talk to you later.